mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Unlimited podcast. We're here with our second episode with Fred Rutger, retired Fish and Wildlife Service pilot biologist. We're going to be exploring some more of his stories during his 30 plus years. Can, is it 30 plus years? 32. Thir- 32, um, 32 years as a pilot biologist conducting all sorts of uh, waterfowl surveys. Uh, we 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 kind of introduced some of his experiences, introduced Fred on the previous episode. I certainly encourage you to go back and listen to that, but we're going to get into some more storytelling and experiences here, hoping to bring all of you a glimpse of the the just how unique this role is, how much it means to this profession, but also some of the neat things that you're able to observe there. Fred, thanks for, for being with us again here. Always a pleasure. We're going to pick right back up and go back to a question that I think I asked you, and I think you answered part of it, and then we got off on something else like it's so easy to do in this conversation. <laughs> what are some of the most memorable wildlife outside of ducks that you saw during these surveys? I'm thinking any bears, I'm thinking wolves, moose, some, what what all did you see? Other kind of uh, large mammals? That well, you didn't, didn't come before across? we go to large mammal life, one of my favorites was seeing a wolverine. Ah. I've only saw one, and they're really, you know, they just don't show themselves when they hear an airplane. You know, they're, they're pretty secret. But on the uh, Arctic coast, on the farthest most line in the BPOP survey, up, up at uh, Tuktoyuk, Latitude, Tuktoyuk, Tuk Latitude, north of Inuvik, near just to the east of uh, the uh, Mackenzie Delta, out toward Pawatuck, um, uh, is almost this year when I was back, you know, helping in the right seat, we did not get to see the barren ground grizzlies. But most years in, in my tenure up there, we would see, and it was kind of near the Anderson River, but just great habitat. But just awesome to see uh, uh, the sow bear and, and, and two or three cubs. I think we saw three cubs one year, but um, just doing their thing on the tundra. <laughs> how, that, that takes me to my question. How far north would your survey lines go? I don't have the map here in front of me to know what uh, sort of survey strata you, you surveyed there, but did you go all the way to the coastal plain? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. Uh, and and uh, yeah, that the, the farthest north line in the whole survey is is obviously the Northwest Territories, uh, and uh, it, we go beyond the tree line. And the last one is we can see the Arctic Ocean as we do that. Unbelievable. Line. Yeah. And where would you stay up there? What's the, here? I am jumping all across the place. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, Inuvik for the most part. Okay, so I have I have stayed in Tuktoyuktuk. Okay. And we vaked, uh, We were there one time for Aboriginal days and uh, th- there's a weekend or a day a Saturday in early June that uh, they celebrate that and uh, we actually got to eat some white fronted goose with wow, the, you know it's yeah. this totally legal uh, uh, and I respect that um, this is part of the culture and uh, but uh, when <laughs> when we were out for a walk the night before we found we wanted to we kind of got up on a bit of a rise on some rocks and sure enough here's all these goose feathers and and <laughs> but but they had Fresh. Uh, yeah Fresh. and anyway uh uh no that uh, you know the people we met in along all that you know doing that it was it was you know a um I had a lot of respect for, you know, when we, when we meet, we met a lot of First Nations people in our banding camps and yeah. all, and it's um, it's all been a real positive thing. We talk about you stopping at various locations along the way. I want to make sure we're clear on kind of how that happens. We talked about it on the previous, uh, well, when we spoke with you earlier this summer. Like you have your time um, 
I don't know what you call it, behind the wind. What do you call it? Behind the windshield? Windscreen. Windscreen. Yeah, behind the windscreen. That's that's kind of tightly controlled in terms of how many days in a row or how many days out of 14 you can do that. Then you have to take some time off, right? There are that's safety correct. protocols in that regard. So I want to want to make sure we're clear on that, why you end up with these days where you're just at these whatever remote locations doing nothing. It's because it's mandated, right? Tell us right. about that. Well, yeah, it's real easy to kind of overload yourself and beyond beyond the flying hours, prepping the airplane, getting it secured for the night, and the data crunch, you know, just a lot of transcribing and, and keeping track of data. But uh, uh, the, the, the rules are the same pretty well throughout government aviation. No more than eight hours, eight flight hours a day. Uh, the old, the old uh, adage in aviation is usually it's about... That's about half. If if you fly five hours a day, you probably commit a ten to it, and that's not doing data or any. That's just in the in the normal aviation world. But uh, but so they mandate that that we take you can't fly any more than twelve in a row, or so many out of fourteen, and all that. So. And what about your favorite fishing experience? The one, the most memorable fishing experience <laughs> when, you're, when you've been up there. The first one that comes to mind with my friend Jesse, uh, we he had showed me a place. It'll may, remain undisclosed. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> near one of his camps. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, we didn't, I didn't, you know, we're, we're doing our thing. We had seen him a few days earlier, but I didn't know he was knocking around that far north from where he lives, but we, we had just landed and we're headed into Cree Lake Lodge on, uh, uh, Crystal Lodge to be more precise on Cree Lake. It's out in the middle of Cree Lake, one of the nor- largest lakes in Northern Saskatchewan. And uh, our, our routine there is we'd usually pick up a little bit of pickerel and, and bring them in. Because at that stage, they're all working on getting boats prepared and, and uh, building new cabins and whatever. So we hadn't seen our friends there yet, but we, that we know that that's the kind of activities going on. So we're going to bring them some fresh pickerel. And we hear another airplane, and it's Jesse. So... I'm in, kind of in his spot. There's no dock there, but we we uh, we're tied up to the to the uh, vegetation. It's, it makes a, a, a wills and whatnot short the short stuff that grows on, on the hummocks there just make a perfect place to tie up. When my first time there, and, and I learned all this from Jesse, but he he came in and he said, "Man, he said we don't even have a place to park." But he we we caught him and and, and got him tied off right you know uh, the two airplanes there together. But I had a, a fellow from um, from the Patuxent uh, uh, headquarters with me that had uh, it really was a, he, he, he was a great outdoorsman, but he hadn't had an opportunity to fish. And uh, I said, here, tie this jig. Or I just gave him a rod with a, a jig on it. And uh, and I said, just let it down to the bottom, close the bale, showed him how to close the bale. And I said, I just lift it up a little. And and just that quick, he's got a pickerel. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but he caught five pickerel, which is the limit, and they were all keepers. Uh, that was limited back then. It might be four now. But anyway, back, uh, Jesse was just like, that guy's never fished. <laughs> it's a testimonial to, to the spot. So that's one fishing story. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, in terms of other things that you saw that are memorable, I I seem to recall may, uh, hearing some rumors about maybe even some nude sunbathers being among your <laughs> observations. Is that right? And you, okay. may, and you may or may not have had to circle back to double count those. We did those. not circle that- back. <laughs> No, I, I'll tell it like I told you last <laughs> night. Uh, and we, we, we're not sure. It's, 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 that's that's kind of a, uh, a You're step. not sure yet. But no, okay. wait, wait, but anyway, here, here's here's the facts. Is as we uh, Ross Hansen, who who was a favorite yeah, we're implicating if, if, people for now. those of us that those <laughs> those in the profession and and those that. Uh, uh, if you haven't read the book Flyways, which is a government publication, it's got a, a long history of, 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 of uh, these surveys and, and waterfowl management in general. Ross uh, uh, was a, 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 a quite the flyway biologist back in the day, and he was sort of known as a bit, a bit prim and proper, for lack of another term, but good guy. And, and uh, I was just... I. It was my first survey. He was like, like we talked about when I 
helped Garrett Wilkerson this year. I was in the right seat, Garrett's first survey in the left. Uh, I was in that role. Uh, I was in the left seat, and Ross was was mentoring me. And I didn't want to do, you know, I'm, I'm kind of brand new to this, and I, I wasn't going to have any distractions. But as we came up on Last Mountain Lake, as we came down, <laughs> down the gym, yeah. yeah, Last Mountain Lake, Saskatchewan, and uh, we came down the hill, and, and this is a July survey. It's not the May survey when the water's still cold, but it's, it's warm enough to swim. And there was a truck parked down by the shoreline, and it's sort of like something out, out of a, a you know, a music video nowadays, if you could, if, if that sets the scene. And as we get closer, I see, and, and this is all on my <laughs> side of the airplane, you know, we're, yeah. we're both yeah. looking out out our respective windows looking. And, <laughs> and anytime you're on a, a major shoreline like that, you're going to be all eyes scouring that shoreline. So Ross was busy with his side and I'm taking this all in on my side, first the truck. And I saw there's people there and uh, yeah, they're swimming. And then as I get closer, I see clothing articles on a big rock. <laughs> and then people start waving. All three are, 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 are you know, they, they, they had taken a break from farm activities. Yeah. They were in the water. Yeah. They were happy. Sure, they had their, all their fields were planted. They were ready to go. <laughs> they, they were happy. They were waving. I wagged my wings. <laughs> and I think I muttered to Ross something about, oh, I, I thought I missed that. Was that a coot? Did you see him? No. <laughs> or something like that. I just, I thought, you know, this is something we don't really need to address here, but yeah. it does stick in my memory. Yeah. Yeah. It probably was not transcribed either. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, but we have, we have uh, memorialized it here. Great story will live on forever. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure you saw a lot of other, other interesting things and in, uh, through the years, uh, anything else from Canada that you want to, to share or Alaska? I don't know if you ever flew into Alaska. Alaska, but um, here's let's let's do this. You flew the 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 northern breeding grounds for 32 years, and what are some of the lasting observations that I guess you would have made regarding how things have changed? What has stood out in your mind, whether it be in the boreal or whether it be in the prairies or just anywhere? Uh, any anything kind of stand out to you? It, the the continuity of habitat. The preponderance of good duck habitat, and uh, it just, uh, for example, I think we covered this in our, when we uh, talked this spring while I was on the survey. But after a five to six year hiatus from being retired and COVID and everything else, and getting back into that country, and now riding in the right seat, not you know, not flying, I had more time to think and look and 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 just reflect. But I just can't, I'm an advocate of, of the boreal forest's waterfowl production area. But when you sit there and look at the endless beaver dam, when you, you see a stream flowing between two larger lakes or coming out of uh, hill country and and as it gets down on the foot, with the terrain, the, the beaver dams are stair-stepped. And it, it's kind of like if you were going to design waterfowl management, I don't, you know, it's, it's management by God. I mean, it, it is just just outstanding the, the amount of, of each one is sort of managed by the beavers for 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 production it's surrounded by grassy metals and and all this uh, but uh, the miles and miles of shorelines around the larger lakes the 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 the, 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 the uh, smaller stream beaver habitat it just the the uh, amount of area is is endless up there and, and has the has the footprint, has the prevalence of those beaver dams changed, increased noticeably over the years since you've been flying that? Has it been noticeable to you? Because I've heard there are some, like if you go back far enough, obviously there the beaver has made a tremendous comeback from, uh, from I don't know, maybe, I don't know what the, the length of time would be, but if you go back far enough, certainly that's the case where we're going to see a lot of beavers now. We're in some places where maybe we... Well, that country lot. was founded on, on beaver trapping and fur trapping and the fur trade, and that's why it was explored and, and uh, all that. So you go that, back that far. But in, in my, uh, in the in the 30-some years and, 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 and since, that window is big enough for me to see a change. I was impressed with it from the first time, continue to be impressed. But, but uh, yeah, I, I, I really 
can't say that I've noticed. It's, it's they're there every year, different beavers, different places, and uh, but yeah. What about, what about the prairies in in terms of grassland conversion, wetland drainage? Because these transects are all the same year after year. Were there any of those areas that you would you would fly year after year after year and noted as great waterfowl habitat, lots of grass, lots of water, and that now it's been converted to agriculture? Or the wetlands have drained. The yes, there's there's uh, you know I'm I'm not flying those areas enough to be you know back in the day I would be familiar with individual wetlands and and maybe come across the hill and say oh my goodness that's not there anymore and tiling operations and whatnot but but uh, the thing I noticed this year riding across the prairies on our way to survey up north is the margins. Uh, uh, You know, uh, the newer uh, implements, um, you know, are the the bigger tractors and and the the huge field cultivators. Uh, I like to eat. I'm not going to slam farmers here. I grew up in a farming community in Illinois. But just the fact is that that the efficiency of being able to... to, um, uh, to, to work the soil with with the, the kind of equipment now, uh, the, the margins just they get it, it's smaller not and yet. smaller. They're yeah. smaller and smaller, and and about the size maybe of a sidewalk, you know, three four feet wide, and it just looks like a predator trap where where it wants to once the fox trots around and does that margin and then walks over the hill to the next one. But uh, so um, you know, I, I think DU has a lot of programs where they where they work with farmers on that and dense nesting cover and where they can. And so yeah, uh, there's it's it's a it's different it depend and we're coming out of the drought you know this year, so it probably looked more pronounced this year. But it's it's you know that's that's what I see as the biggest change. Well, and you're right. We have that's why the programs that we have in place up there in Canada and the U.S. are so important. They're important for for because we want to conserve, restore those habitats. But we have to do it in a way that's compatible with the the desires of the landowner. You know, we as you said, we all got to eat. We can't we we can't take that route. You know, and throw all of our farmers under the bus. We have to find a way to to work together to um, produce these multiple benefits, including food and including wildlife from from those resources. Because we all care about all those different things. Fred, I want to uh, want to talk about Mexico and maybe any of your your activities in the U.S. You've like talked about you flew the midwinter survey for a number of years. Uh, how difficult was that relative to the breeding population survey? I've talked to people that have flown those surveys and they say it's totally different, way harder to, to do the midwinter surveys because you're dealing with much larger larger groups of birds. Do you, did you find that to be generally true? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the straight line transects on a breeding population survey, especially on the prairies, you might be following a fence line or a road uh, in the bush. Now that we have all the navigation tools, it's a little easier. But, but basically, it's a straight and level transect, and uh, you're counting breeding birds and uh, pairs, single drakes, small groups. In the winter, you're probably maneuvering around flocks and trying to count those flocks and put numbers on them and keep track of if they're uh, where they're going, if they're rolling up to the next line oh, yeah. or where in the next pass. So uh, it it's a challenge. It's, it's, uh, I, I love uh, to fly with with seasoned observers, and 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 we know we you know. Uh, fly with the same folks year in and year out. They know what I can do and I know what they can do and 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 my I get my satisfaction out of maneuvering the airplane. I like the word presentation. Give give them the best presentation I can for the wind, the light, you know, you don't want glare, if you can eliminate the glare factor. And uh, so I got a lot of satisfaction out of maneuvering for the best possible count. And, um, but they, you know, the old adage of, of, uh, of counting and wintering ground is how do you count 
thousands of that. You know, if you get a, a raft of uh, scop that numbers in a thousand here in Louisiana, something like that. And I said, you start with 10. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, 10 is 10 and, and 10 groups, that's 100. And 100 in your mind's eye. And a lot of the midwinter stuff on puddle ducks you can do in, in hundreds, in estimate hundreds. So, but uh, like, like, Ducks down on the Laguna Madre in Mexico, you're getting in the thousands, and as you go through that flock, okay, now we're in the thousands, and and uh, but it's it's an you know it's it's an experience. It's uh, hopefully comparable from year to year, but it's the midwinters that kind of it's not as scientific. It's not the science that goes into the breeding population survey. Yeah, there's so many other variables there, and and plus that some of the transect methods differ from one state to the next. You, do, I think, whenever you were talking about maneuvering around flocks. You're describing what we refer to as cruise surveys, where you go to the large concentrations of ducks. You try to, in some areas where, let's say, you have rather discrete, maybe smaller scale, relatively speaking, um, blocks of habitat, and you try to achieve some type of complete coverage, right? That's sort of a cruise survey. There are some states, Louisiana is one of them, Texas is one, I think. Uh, Louis- Arkansas. Arkansas and Mississippi, they've all kind of moved to a transect-based uh, technique but it's still, I mean, and so although they're flying in a straight line, they still have to contend with the, the biological aspects of that. You have the big flocks, flocks of birds during winter, whereas you don't necessarily in uh, on the breeding ground breeding surveys. Which did you prefer, the breeding ground survey? Yes, I mean I preferred it all. I mean in in, in the <laughs> summer, yeah, in the su- in, in you know on the bre- it, we you know all of us that did this enjoyed doing your respective areas up north. You you got to know the people, you got to know, you you wanted to see what the ducks were doing. If it's a drought year, if it's a good year, it's always like what's happening with the birds. Um, The uh, wintering grounds uh, is the same thing. Like where are the ducks this year? What are they doing? And and it's, it's, it's a different level of satisfaction but it's all there's no there there weren't any bad surveys in the in the whole game talk to you now about Mexico. I know you flew a number of surveys there. Tell us about that. That was part of the midwinter. How many years did you do that? And where, what parts of Mexico did you, did you fly? I did that. The, there's three survey areas in Mexico, the East Coast, the Central Highlands, and the Pacific Coast. And the, the two coasts are just sad. They're the coastal lagoons and, and the, the Central Highlands are more uh, discrete lakes up in higher country, but I was since I'm based in Lafayette, Louisiana, I did the Eastern unit. What were what were some of your favorite experiences there and, and memories? Had you have you dealt a lot? Had you have did you have a lot of experience with the waterfowl habitats, wetlands of Mexico before you started doing the survey? I did my first survey with Art Brazda while he was still working. That was in '85. And I was amazed we get down there and the numbers of ducks and and the um, uh, the diversity of the habitat and the expanses like down in um, in um, the state of Tabasco and Campeche and it goes on and on and uh, uh, but yeah it, it was it was as as time went on I got more familiar with, you know, it wasn't as uh, intimidating uh, to find your way around. I mean, it, that was a cruise survey. We could, this is a good time to talk about the differences since yeah, we've, sure. we've, we've talked about cruise versus transect and that habitat is so large down there to transect it with any kind of confidence levels. It would take a whole lot more effort than we put into it. We would try to do that survey in two weeks or less, and you just had to kind of cruise through it and and, and uh, not necessarily high grade to habitat, but try to use to the best of your ability to get get the good stuff, some mediocre stuff, and even some poor stuff to, to mix it all up and, and uh, 
there wasn't a science, but it did give us numbers. And I think to, I th- if Eduardo could hear this, I think he'd agree that back in the day that what we wanted to do would just show the significance of the habitat and, and document where it was and all that. But it, in terms of the numbers for management, uh, the accuracy wasn't there as much as what surveys are going to be moving forward. And the Eduardo that you're talking about is Eduardo Carrera. He's our... Um well, he's the equivalent of the CEO for Dumac. I'm not sure if he is, if that's the title of, that he has. Uh, maybe executive. I forget. I forget. He's exactly. the senior guy that knows. He's Mr. Mexico as ducks go. That's right. That's right. That's right. He's the he's the head of uh, of Ducks Unlimited to Mexico, uh, and and. I remember you and I sat down in my office in Lafayette a number of years ago. I was asking you about some of these different wetland eco regions uh, in Mexico and having you, my my question to you simply was like, if you had to rank these in terms of importance, because we could look at some of the numbers, it's kind of hard to pull some of the numbers out of some of those regions. Um, Or maybe that's not actually true. What I was trying to do is uh, that's what I was doing was pulling some of the numbers out of that data set and putting them into these different regions. And I was wanting to get just an idea of what this habitat looks like and maybe trying to partition out some of them by species or whatever. But anyway, you were talking to me about some of these areas, and one of the things that I remember is that you talking about just how impressive they were, but how that could vary from year to year. And so I want to say the Tabasco Lagoons, this may, may not be right, is one that when it's wet, is that right? Or is yeah, there no, no. that when it's wet, it's it's expansive, like you wouldn't, you couldn't imagine. It's very shallow, covered with teal. Am I getting that right? You're that, getting, yeah. Okay. It, Tell it, us it, about that. What I mean, what's that happen when you say have waterfowl habitats in Mexico? The uh, there's the Alvarado lagoons. There's uh, the Tabasco lagoons. There's uh, the some of the wetlands along the Yucatan. Some of the mangrove uh, forest there. Al- Alvar- Alvarado lagoons are a great example, and what the, uh, uh, the classic habitat there is uh, is uh, a lot of subsistence uh, farming. Um, you know, people will be uh, on the uh, on I call it bayous here in Louisiana, but they're on the river systems. Uh, there are some roads, but there's still places where people are getting getting around by, by boat and a few cattle and all, and, and, and they're actually, as, as you drop into the marsh, we see the birds, especially blue-winged teal, in and around these areas where where the people are setting back succession and with their cattle and all, and my, the, the, it begs it. The easiest way to describe this is I used to say, show sow me some, some cattle with wet hooves and I'll show you some blue-winged teal. So that's, uh, yeah, so, you, you know, uh, it, it's really interesting. You can make the case that, that there's more birds in slightly disturbed areas than yeah. just uh, totally pristine areas. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, I don't think that's a stretch at all. In fact, I mean, that is absolutely the truth in a lot of cases. And we've seen it here in Louisiana. Uh, you go three or four years, or maybe it's more like four or five, six years, and some of these coastal marshes begin to grow up in some monotypic stands of vegetation that aren't all that productive from a food standpoint, at least the vegetation itself. Now, you get the marsh ponds where there's still submerged aquatics that are growing, and then whenever we get a hurricane or some some surge of some salt water that sets back, kills a lot of that robust emergent vegetation, and two or three years after that, you get it's basically like a... 10,000 acre moist soil unit or 100,000 acre moist exactly. soil unit out there in some of those locations. Not that we would ever wish for uh, a tropical storm surge or hurricane to do that, but it's an observation of these some of these processes, natural processes that have existed historically that cause this periodic reset of that successional staging. And then, of course, some of these, um, some, some agricultural ranching activities simulate some of those same types of disturbance and their effect on those on those systems. And that's kind of what you're describing there. So I believe you. Okay. <laughs> I believe you for sure. Now, flying in Mexico, uh, you, don't, you don't speak Spanish? You're not fluent in Spanish? Poquito. Uh, <laughs> it's very little. <laughs> very little. So that had to, uh, that's probably what you meant by when you say when you came a lo- became a little more comfortable with it. Uh, how much, how, mu- how intimidating was that, you know, whenever you're flying into some of these remote areas also? Um, 
and you can't speak as as fluent as maybe you would like to. Did their air, tra- air traffic controllers speak English? Quite Most well? of them do. Yes, at the, at the bigger air, where 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 we'd fuel at the larger airports, they did. You you <laughs> another Phil Stor- Thorpe story here. He 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 uh, was learning some Spanish, and he thought, well, I'll just answer them <laughs> answer them in Spanish because uh-huh. most of the the traffic the chatter on the frequency and, pronunciation. Yeah, matters. and 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 then. Uh, it was no, don't go down that <laughs> road because they think you know it. Now we're in over uh-huh. our heads, but uh, uh, no, it it, it 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 the airports are set up for for good, safe operations. Did you ever find yourself because you're flying low? Um, and when you're doing some of these surveys, when you're doing the midwinter surveys, are you still flying about 150 feet? Or are you able to come up a little? No, pretty much that. Pretty much yeah, you might be a little higher, and then when you're really counting, trying to get numbers on ducks, you're probably back down in 150. And and help me on the years here, Fred. Uh, I know the last time that those surveys in Mexico were flown, you know, prior to what's happening now, they're trying to resume some of the surveys and have been over the last three or four years. But there was a window of time. Was it like 2009? Six, Six I think was that, the yeah, last time. 2006 is when stuff got... Uh, it got know, a little risky. A little risky. Yeah. And uh, so that was the last uh, survey. I was still working then. And uh, uh, to my knowledge, that's the last U.S. Fish and Wildlife survey okay. down there. All right. And so did you... How many do you recall? How many years prior to that they had done those surveys in Mexico? It went back. Oh, it goes a long. It it goes, yeah, it goes a long way. That that's a. uh, There's pictures in flyways of a grum and goose, uh, uh, army surplus government goose in a banana plantation down there, and and uh, yeah, it goes way back. Uh, Art Brass does, who who I followed him in Lafayette. Uh, uh, yeah, like I say, my first survey with him, I think I did two or three with him before while well, he was still around and then took it over after he retired. But uh, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's got a long history. And did you, kind of going back to the safety issue and the time period when it began to get a little bit risky, did you ever find yourself when you were doing any of those surveys in a situation that you felt a little uneasy about? I I have and I got this story in my head from somewhere, and I don't think it's true, uh, but I wanted to say I, I think I'd told somebody that there was a story where you had you were flying on some of these uh, midwinter surveys in Mexico, and maybe you entered into the wrong airspace or something, and you were escorted down by some Mexican fighter pilots. But you told me that you didn't recall that happening. Is no, that somebody, uh, maybe somebody. That might have been <laughs> it somebody wasn't, else. It wasn't fighter pilots, <laughs> but we got a really good look at a Huey helicopter with, oh, okay. with, with carbine, with the doors open and, oh, and, and okay. the guns. Maybe that's what I'm remembering. And, uh, anyway... Uh, uh, it was the end. It was Tommy Misha was with me a lot. Well, that a lot would of, explain a lot. Well, that way, and, and, and <laughs> I got to tell you, I told Tommy was into his element counting blue wings. We were really tightly maneuvering just north of Merida and uh, that that be- beautiful country up there. Merida's where, there on the, the Yucatan. Um, yep. Where the west uh, side. Yeah, but help me out where Ducks and, Ducks and Limited uh, has. Celestoon. Celestoon. The, the Johnny we were Walker. Not, uh, it was a little, uh, exactly. Uh, we weren't far from there. We were in that habitat, in the mangrove habitat, and, and it was really loaded up with teal. And we were doing our thing, and I happened to catch the helicopter, and, and he's he's converging on us. And I was on the Merida Tower frequency. And like I say, they this is all well before 911, when now people monitor guard frequency, the universal uh, emergency frequency in aviation, 121.5. So if it was nowadays, you'd have cranked a radio up or already been on that on one, you know, like, who are you guys or whatever. We'd have sorted it out. But uh, the, I made a turn. Tommy said, "Oh, they're just they they they, they they're watching us count." Uh, I, said, I classic shook my head. Tommy. That's classic. classic Tommy, military and, helicopter. Oh, they're just wanting to see yeah, what yeah, we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so I make a turn just to see what they do. They turned right with us, and they're kind of closing on us a little bit. And so I'm I'm already. On Merida Tower frequency, and 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 uh, I just I said we're uh, we're obviously 
being intercepted out here. Um, I'm, um, and he's and they didn't know what you know they don't know what's going. Anyway, I said uh, I'd like to come direct Merida and land, and, and you know that's approved and all that. So that's what we did. and They stayed right with us when we landed. I landed at the bait the. FBO to fix base operators right next to the tower, and and I I kind of got over closer to the tower and and uh, shut down there. Yeah, and they landed right beside us. All the young guys with the guns jumped out and surrounded us. And, wow. Uh, they, we fit the mo, you know, we fit the model of drug runners. You know, we're manu- float plane. Yeah. And, and yeah. it looks like maybe we're trying to find a boat, a rendezvous, and drop, or whatever. That, in their mind, that's, that's what we were doing. The last thing on there, I, you know, was counting, counting ducks. ducks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... That was the first thing on Tommy's mind. He just knew <laughs> that's what they were after. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, the ultimate biologist. That's right. So... Anyway, uh, Dr. Misho. Uh-huh. Anyway, uh, uh, when we, as soon as we landed, the, the El Jefe comes and j- comes up on the float, papers, and I just happened to have all my documents in the right seat behind Tommy and presented it to him. I mean, this is through the window. We hadn't opened a door or anything yet. And he's some, who, who are you guys? Well, he spoke English. And uh, I said, we're U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, biologists. We're doing an international, you know, we have permission here with Megan. We dropped some names, uh, Center NAP and all the all the agencies. And, and it, But you could see it start as he turned pages and heard that. You could see, like, these guys aren't what we want. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it was over as quickly as it started. He he. Oh, and and while he was doing that, I didn't have the baggage compartment locked. There's guys on the float pulling stuff out and tossing it down wow, and starting yeah. to open up our personal bags and stuff. And they're looking, you know, and and they're all kind of shaking their heads too. Like, where's why did we stop these guys? It, but so anyway, that was uh, they. It, he just did a, a you know. Motion. Cut There's it off, yeah. Here, yeah, yeah, and and they kind of drifted off. But it, wow. it does kind of go on. We walk into the into the FBO, and there's a, a guy in there, and uh, he says, "What happened out there?" And uh, I said, "Well, they thought we were druggies, and we're we're doing surveys, counting ducks." Oh yeah, he said, "How do you do that?" And uh, and I told him some stuff more than he wanted to know, and he said, um, "Where are you based, Lafayette, Louisiana?" And uh, he said, Louisiana. He said, how the Saints doing? <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is an interesting uh-huh. thing. And I said, uh, yeah, I said, I really don't follow sports that much. Well, how do you, how, you know, uh, who, now, this Department of Interior, who are they? I said, well, Spark Service, us, Fish and Wildlife. And I went on, named the other BOM and the other agencies. And it's like, I'm being really interviewed here. And, uh, so fine, it's, he's kind of lightening up a little bit. Oh, when he started this, he rolled a badge, and he, he named it. I didn't really say, can I really look at that, you know, or nothing. But I, I, I was going along with it. And I said, when we finish, I said, I'd like to talk to that game warden. Because when this started, I thought we scared the flamingos, and it was, was that. And I said, obvious was well beyond that. And uh, he muttered to me it, with an adjective in there, he's not a game warden. <laughs> and, and I'm not quite who I told you who I was. He told me he was from the State Department. He's here to help me. He was a, a customs agent, and uh, for U.S. Uh, you know, for U.S. Customs, they're down there in Merida. Okay, in Merida. Yeah, I saw their citation later, and with her Ishkash experience at the air shows, I've got to meet a lot of those customs yeah. guys over the years. But anyway, he was quite cordial. He said, "Incidentally, you pass. Now, how do we help you get settled?" And and it was o- that was over too. But it was quite the afternoon. But um, um, anyway, uh, that was that was. He said, "Look, n- nobody trusts anybody down here. We got to do our own sure. our own thing." And he said, "Obviously, you guys are you check you know, out." Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. You did all the talking and not Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, any other any other kind of harrowing experience like that? I. Um, yeah. Anything else come to mind? I think you told me one, you hinted to one story where you, you know, fuel, you have to be really conscious of fuel uh, and being able to get from one location to the other. Any, uh, a lot of planning goes into that. You ever find yourself in a situation where you 
Um, yeah, you, you thought maybe you'd made a bad decision or you started to get worried about anything? Oh, I like lots of fuel. My, yeah. My, my model is the only way you can have too much fuel is to be on fire. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, loading and all that, uh, you might fudge a number here or there once in a while to get to have that extra fuel. But, um, uh, and, and with the equipment the guys have today with the turbine airplanes, that's not as, you know, they, they have adequate equipment when, to where we were flying the heavy, the heavy amphibs with piston engines so yeah. so that that's kind of corrected itself over the years but uh so no nothing else that was um oh i know the one you want is uh, we, we had dinner last night and i mentioned a time we were trying to get into tampico and the weather went down yeah and we couldn't it. we couldn't um I, I was within three or four miles to the airport but the airport's up on the hill there's uh, petrochemical plants all the way around the or on three sides of the airport uh, with some pollution and and if the weather goes down at all there's always smoke but uh, the mist and the smoke and it, it goes to zero zero and uh we're, we're again we're heads down doing our thing over to laguna and when we get ready to land i call and i knew it wasn't going to be the best weather but they gave me like zeros in the, and he says, above instrument minimum, sir. And uh, I said, I'm just not current. I don't have the right equipment to do it. Say your intentions. I said, I'm going back to La Pesca, which is 90 miles back up the coast. And uh, But anyway, long story short, we had adequate fuel to get there. But I knew when we made that decision that they don't sell fuel there that we'll figure that out later but it turned into quite the uh, quite the evening um we 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 landed without incident and uh but then we have to figure out the fuel and it involved our our host at the uh at the ranch where we stayed before working it out with the uh mexican navy to sign some papers so we could take jerry cans of victoria Mexico and buy fuel and uh, it involved a cabrito dinner and a celebration <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway it, it was a uh, uh, it turned out okay yeah and, and so the reason that you couldn't land at that other airport is because vis- low visibility was that the, yeah the, the deal fog because- and moved in of temperature dew point went okay. the it's right along the coast we, yeah. we were be- in the coastal lagoon it's a mile or two wide and then the airport's up on a hill Fred, we'll, I think we'll try to wrap to start wrapping the wrapping this up. Uh, I could ask you a lot of additional questions about some of your you know, favorite habitats that you've seen and a whole host of other things. But we'll start to wrap this up. I do want to ask you, what are some of the more memorable observations that you would have made of, of waterfowl? Like either in terms of the concentrations that you've seen, I'm thinking Laguna Madre, you know, when you those big, huge rafts of redheads, but also... Uh, like Mexico, some some of the if would you would have does anything there stand out in your mind in terms of oh my gosh look at all these birds I just run through a litany of what pops into my mind redheads in Mexico on the Laguna Madre, mallards in Arkansas, canvas back in Maryland, and I got to you know think but it's all the places that that people have hunted and 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 and, and uh, live around these incredible places on the continent you know there i've i've always enjoyed getting to see that and uh, and a good, a good problem i have is how are we going to get a you know on a cruise survey how are we going to maneuver to get all the ducks you know and get them in the count and, and uh, it's it's uh, it's been an enjoyable career to to see those sites so, Fred, you've kind of you kind of hinted at some of what I want to end with here, and that is kind of reflecting on your career. That's always fun for me to do to hear people talk about that and see the enjoyment in their their face as they think about that. You you clearly have enjoyed what you've done. How fortunate do you think you've been? Do you consider yourself to have been to be one of the group of people that have meant so much to this profession that is really responsible for 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 some of the I guess tremendous data sets that set waterfowl, waterfowl management apart from a lot of other uh, groups of birds historically. There's a lot of other bird group birds and data sets that are coming on li- online now. But historically, waterfowl have really stood out as being rich in data that we have available to study the populations and learn about them. And a lot of that is because of the work that people like you have done. We've talked about the breeding population survey. But you're also a very critical role in, in the banding programs 
And without the banding programs, you don't get the, the band recoveries, harvest estimation, the, the survival estimation, all that kind of stuff. So people like you have filled an incredible um, role in this entire enterprise. How fortunate and how thankful are you that you've been able to do that? Very fortunate. Uh, amazing. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, growing up small town in Illinois and and hunting ducks and then wanting to get into this profession and getting into aviation. So uh, it's been very rewarding. I like a quote by Bob Jessen, uh, legendary uh, waterfowl biologist for the state of Minnesota. And he used to, when he'd be in meetings, and he'd say, with one of us, maybe not me, but some, one of the other flyaway biologists, he said, look, these guys are the eyes and ears of the Fish and Wildlife Service. What they see is important, you know. So anyway, uh, but yeah, it was a, a wonderful ride. And, um, you know, we're, we're transit. We, uh, I had the pleasure of flying with Garrett Wilkerson from Louisiana, who uh, is our newest flyway biologist. And, and we talked a lot about his path, how he got here. But uh, when I'm doing work now um, as a temporary person for DU and doing some events and talking to students and whatnot, uh, my, my, Advice to them is get a job, get a summer job if you have to volunteer, but get to know people within the agencies. Uh, a resume, you know, knowing people and, and getting um, uh, your foot in the door, so to speak. I had, we covered, you know, I had some lucky circumstances, but if you can, if you can get in inside of wildlife agency and work your way, you know, you're, you're, a, you're something besides a, a resume in a pile. And uh, so I just say, look, I, I uh, graduated with people probably a lot smarter than I am, but they're, they're doing something else because they didn't know anybody when they got out of school. So that's, that's the first one. Uh, the, the combining wildlife and uh, aviation, I think, is a great thing to do now. Right here where we are, coastal erosion, it just begs aerial stuff. And there's another avenue to go is drone yeah. stuff. That's yep. you know, there's there's uh, 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 all, all the uh, imagery stuff that's coming on board. Right. There's there as as uh, as we move on in time, the technology is going to be there for aerial uh, imagery and all. So get out there, get involved, and good luck. Fred, I thank you personally for all that you've done for waterfowl, waterfowl management. On behalf of everybody in Ducks Unlimited, I also thank you, and I thank all your your fellow fish and wild, current and past Fish and Wildlife Service pilot biologist, flyway biologist, for all the work that y'all have done. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do without all of your work, all of your, all the data that you've helped collect. So just a tremendous thank you to you for all of that professionally. And thank you personally for everything that you've, you've helped me with over the years. And thanks for sharing your time yet again here with us on the Ducks Unlimited podcast. It's been great, Fred. Appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure. A very special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Fred Rutger, retired U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service pilot biologist. We thank him for his, his years of service, and I thank him for his friendship here. As, as always, we thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the wonderful work he does getting these podcasts out to you. And to you, the listener, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your support and commitment to wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash DU Podcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the ducks.